wanted to make sure that I give time to answer questions, specific questions concerning what I've been saying in the uh, over these last two weeks. And the questions that are coming up are good. You're actually engaging with the material, and I'm glad to see that. And you're also bringing up uh, responses that have to do with some of the things I've said and also some of the things that I possibly haven't said. And, and here's a question that is along that line. It's, it's, it's done by um, Farid Khaltech. I assume, Farid, that you are a Muslim. And, and you say, let me, let me go ahead and quote this verbatim. Some of the Quranic stories do seem to be real events that happened with the real person called Muhammad during his lifetime. For example, when we look at Surah Qatar, or Qautar, uh, which is Surah 108, the shortest surah of the Quran, we find Muhammad's God, that's Allah, directly attacking a man who told Muhammad that he does not have any male children. Now, um, <laughs> Surah 108 doesn't say that. It just says that he uh, he's condemning this man to hell. It doesn't even say what the reason is for. The tafsir, the traditions, unpack that and possibly uh, in mention that it's because Muhammad doesn't have any male children. You go on to say the other shocking surah is Surah Al-Masad 111, in which he directly attacks Abu Lahab, his uncle, condemning him to hell. And I kind of said, to... well, okay, what is specific about that? Why is that somehow... A, something that's not found right through the Quran. I think the Quran is full of reference after reference after reference, condemning this person and that person, the pagans, the Jews, all these other people who do not follow Muhammad and do not support him to hell. So that should not be new. I don't know why, if that, why that's part of your, uh, uh, your argument. But then you go on to say, these surahs seem to relate to day-to-day -day events in the Prophet's life. I do not contend that Muhammad might be a later redaction. Maybe there was a historical person who, with a cult following in Arabia, and they and then Islam was built around this man. But then, for that matter, much of the Quran is built around his needs, his problems. And so I can understand then why this might look like it, it's so specific. It's dealing with one man. It's talking about his hatred or the fact that he's condemning these people to hell. So how could that not be true? Or how could we say this is a later redaction? And if it's so, it would still be a redaction of this on this Muhammad. The problem is redaction by definition means it comes from much later, be, uh, re, uh, re, put, put on to someone who is much, much earlier. In this case, the traditions, which are only begin to appear with Ibn Ishaq in 765, though we don't have his material. So I always say Ibn Hisham 833. Now, I am not at all suggesting that these stories about Muhammad have not been concocted and put together by later redactors. That's understandable. Remember, once Muhammad was chosen in the late 7th century by Abd al-Malik, he put his name on the Dome of the Rock, he introduced his name on the coins, he introduced his name on the Caliphal Protocols. Once that had been done, they now had a prophet, then they needed to have a revelation. And once the revelation starts to be put together, as we have said, uh, the Quranic manuscripts do seem to appear from... 705 and on, and they start to uh, proliferate from that time. You then have to build a story around this man. So it stands to reason by the late 8th century, 765, this is starting to happen. But it's still not good enough, so another 50 years later, or even more, and in this case it would be almost 78 late years later, when Ibn Isham finally writes it down in the form that he wants it, that's in the 9th century, now you're starting to get the man and his story. So his story comes a good 100 to 130 years after the book that he supposedly was revealed uh, was started to be uh, concocted. We still don't even know when that book was finished. That's another million dollar question. But in that intervening 130 years, what do you think was happening? Who do you think? I mean, the, the point, point is for over a century, they were concocting these stories and take one bit of story and applying it to another and then other people would take this and then apply and sometimes they would apply their they would apply things to their own lives so as storytellers start to retake these stories and and orally send them on and this is all done orally this is not written down that's why it's not written down it's done orally by these kusas these are the storytellers they're well known as this as they do, they start introducing even parts of their own story into the story. That would make sense because it enlivens it, it for themselves and they can also relate to it much better. It can soak in their audience relate it. So that after a while, these get embellished, these get embellished, and then, as you can see, they finally get put into a written text in the 
early 9th century. Well, that's two to 300 years later. So from one man, possibly, who was named Muhammad, who they're saying, and he probably did live in the 7th century, to the pen of another, finally, 200 years later, we then get the man Muhammad today, uh, what we're using today. But he has been embellished and proliferated and uh, added upon right through that intervening 200 years. It's fascinating because this is referred, uh, and Patricia Corona refers to this very thing. Let me just quote what Patricia Corona says. She says this about these storytellers, these kusas. And I quote from her. As This is from 1987 in her book on uh, on Meccan trade and the rise of Islam, where it says, A storyteller followed upon storyteller. The recollection of the past was reduced to a common stock of stories, themes, and motifs that could be combined and recombined in a profusion of apparently factual accounts. Each combination and recombination would generate new tales, details, and as spurious information accumulated, genuine information would be lost. In the absence of any alternative tradition, early scholars were forced to rely on the tales of the storytellers, as did Ibn Ishaq in 765, Al-Wakiri in 835, and other historians, Ibn Hisham 833. It is because they relied on the same repertoire of tales that they all said such similar things. So Patricia Crone is admitting this. This is very true, and this is what you would expect if it's done orally. And remember, we we have, and I've said this. This is the problem with the old Islamic traditions. They have all been passed down orally. Muslims admit that because Muslims are aware of the fact that they don't have anything written down until 833, and that every one of these akbars, every one of these these traditions, has a list of names called isnad. The mutton is preceded by the isnad, and the isnad are a list of names from which that story came through. And it came through many, many generations, many hands, and in every time you can see these are recombined and recombined, and new ideas were added, especially ideas that were specific to that person's life, like you're giving the example with Surah 108 and Surah 111, though they're not probably not the best examples. Dr. Michael Cook says this. He talks about this proliferation, and he talks about how this, from Ibn Isaac all the way up to uh, the time of Ibn, when it, Ibn Isham, when we finally get it written down, and al wakidi who comes after that, take a look and see how this proliferates. So he mentions this, talking about the father of Muhammad, Abdullah, known as Abdullah. Ibn Ishaq in 765 says about Abdullah that he died early enough to leave Muhammad an orphan. But as to the specific details of his death, God knew best. And that's what Michael Cook says in his book on page 63. Wakiri, however, writing 50 years later, mentions when Abdullah died, how he died, where he died, what his age was, and the exact place of his burial. So according to Michael Cook, this evolution in the course of half a century from uncertainty to a profusion of precise detail suggests that a fair amount of what Wakiri knew was not knowledge. And I think, Haltech, uh, that is the problem right here. You're bringing up a good point, and that's a very good point. And that is, why are these stories so specific? And why is it that there's so many of them that are personal? And why is it they deal with one man, Muhammad? How Wouldn't they be true if they were so specific? Yes, exactly. Especially if it's been embellished over the, over the years, and if it has been added to, and if it also uh, includes parts and areas of the person who's telling of their own life. Uh, I lived in West Africa with my wife, for five years, we lived in uh, the country of Senegal, in the city of Ties, inland. And our next-door neighbors were griots. Griots are the, the equivalent in West Africa to what the Kusas were back in the 8th and 9th century in Arabia. They were storytellers. And these griots uh, would go to these ingentes. These ingentes would be, uh, whenever a child is born, they would have a baptism uh, for the child. And they would have, they bring their drums, and they really hit their drums, and they are brilliant to listen to. And we would always be invited to these ingentes of our friends. And I remember as we would sit there, these uh, griots would come up to us and they would slap a 5,000 CFA, or CFA as they called it, a note on our knee. And then they would start drumming their drums. And depending on what we did with that 5,000 uh, CFA note, either if we left it on our knee they would then give us a story about our history, and I would get stories about my history. But if we doubled it, if we put a 10,000 CFA, took the 5,000 and replaced it with the 10,000, doubled it, 
we would get a completely different story about my history. It was fascinating. I, being an American, the only American there, I suddenly got a whole history. I had no idea that I was born, that I, my ancestry comes from Africa, or that my uh, my ancestors had a whole line of African uh, African great men of God and also great leaders, because I, if I, I had doubled it, if I didn't double it, I would have all kinds of brigands and dacoits in my history. And this is well known in West Africa. This is, it's almost like entertainment. And to be, keep from being embarrassed, you always doubled it or tripled whatever they put down. And that's how they made their money. Now, that's a tradition that continues even today. It's the same tradition you have with the Kusas. The Kusas would do the same thing. They would take a story. They would embellish it depending on their hearers, depending on who was listening, depending on how much money they got. They would have all kinds of royalty in your family history. And if you didn't give them a lot of money, they would put an awful lot of robbers and decoits and a lot of despicable people into your ancestry. If that's happening even today in the 21st century in places like West Africa, why are we surprised that this did not happen back in the 7th, 8th, and 9th century? It's nothing has changed. Storytellers have always been around. Storytellers are made and known for that. And that's why I would not be surprised if many of these things are quite specific. And, and they, as they get and the repertoire gets added to along the way, you can expect that much of that which is there, as Cook said, amounts to that which was not knowledge. It's not historical. It's not real knowledge. It's nothing more than cultural, uh, cultural baggage, personal items that are added here and there just to liven it up and to make it more entertaining. Okay, I hope that helps. This is Jay then, over and out, talking about the Kusas and the Griots in my office. God bless you. Let's go for the next question.